Eugene in Russia talking about the Russian IT boom, but I last saw him in Davos, where he was one of the bells of the ball last week, because certainly, particularly I would say in the energy sector and in banking, um, this is a moment when there seems to be a real dawning awareness of the cybersecurity threat, and I can see people looking at Eugene's badge, seeing his last name and kind of making a beeline towards him. Um, it's a real pleasure to have Howard here on the panel. Um, Howard has had really an amazing career as I was reviewing interviews with him and his biography. I don't know how you fit it all in. He's had a career sort of spanning some of the top jobs with global technology companies. Obviously, most recently, this very important role in the White House and a very distinguished military career as well. Um, so Howard has occupied this sort of crossroads between high, the policy at the highest level, military, and technology. And I'm therefore going to start with him. A warning to you both, gentlemen, this is all on the record. Uh, so good news for my colleagues in the media who are here. Uh, and the three of us will talk until 11 o'clock sharp. We can move on to the next item on the agenda. So Howard, here's what I wanted to ask you. You have served most recently in the White House dealing with the cybersecurity issue at this highest geopolitical level. Uh, I'd love to hear about the concerns that you have around those tables, the concerns the President has, and, and, and if you could maybe also explain how, you know, for those of us who don't have the privilege of serving in the White House, why this should matter. Who gets caught in the crosshairs? Well, well thank you, and, and Eugene, it's good seeing you again, and, and everyone, thank you, all of you for being here, and the toughest job is moderating the two of us. Uh, because we may be here at about 3 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, but in order to, to, to deal with the, the, the question on hand, it's really interesting because depending upon who you talk to, their perspective is different. What's the most important thing? You mentioned the various sectors that Eugene was talking with. Uh, in some places, it's all about the electricity. It's all about the energy generation sector is probably the most critical. Uh, others say the financial services. Um, and others that appropriately say, say, well, the telecommunications industry. And you start looking at all these pieces, uh, and the bottom line is they're so intertwined, uh, so interdependency, that a failure in any one of those would inevitably, in a relatively short period of time, call, fit, cause failures in others. The other piece of it, and this is the part that was focused on when I was at the White House the first time after September 11th, uh, were those events that could be done in cyberspace, as we call it, that could indeed cause some sort of a kinetic event. Uh, you have uh, a situation where you have a nuclear reactor that interfering with the industrial control system, digital control system, SCADA, whatever you want to call it, that causes it to A, either not recognize that something is going bad and let it get out of control and cause death and mayhem, in addition to the impact on the critical infrastructure. Or the flip side of that is to make something that's working well look like it's not and causing people to shut things down which then has the same effect. So the perspective is different. The biggest challenge is we're not starting from, we're all not starting from the same spot. Uh, you'll take, uh, and I'll use the, the energy sector for a moment. If you were to look at just across the United States, the tens of thousands of electrical related companies, whether you're generator, transmission, delivery mechanism, they're different. They're different companies. They're different stages. They Some see security as a major component. Other ones are saying, well, we're not going to spend any money because we can't afford to, to raise rates. So it's really tough in the White House position on how do you look at this and come up with some sort of a plan to solve a problem that's everybody's problem. And last quick comment on that when you start, when you ask questions about what is the president here? Well, obviously, there, there's two pieces. The commander-in-chief, there's the military piece of it, the defense of the nation. But the other side, the economic viability, which was an interesting and a very, very uh, well-thought-out uh, position as far as I was concerned. This, unlike the previous position I held, I was dual had it between not only the National Security Council, but also the National Economic Council. So you get to legally sit in the room and say, for national security, let's lock this down, let's turn this off, let's make this not work. 
And on the economic side, says, no, leave it on. It has to work faster. It has to do, do more uh, for less. So it was this constant challenge and, and pressure trying to balance security with the economic impact that we would have if something does go wrong. I think that's a really good point. I'm just going to ask you a quick follow-up, Howard. How do you strike that balance? Because that's not just a balance that the White House needs to strike. It's a balance that companies need to strike, that individuals need to strike. Well, the, the simplest thing is you understand there are no absolutes in this sort of in security. You must have risk mitigation, risk management processes in place. And the idea of, of saying somehow everything has got to be 100% secure, it's not good for business, and you have to sort of look at your own business process, also how that fits into the big scheme when it comes to uh, critical infrastructure, either nationally or, or globally, and you come out and figure out how do we get down this path. So there's no uh, special key that you can put in and say, okay, we've got the balance because it changes day by day, situation by situation, and dependencies on the technology. Okay, Eugene, I'd like to ask you to pick up on that, and in particular, having just been in Davos, I'd like to hear from you, is the perception of threat uniform across industries, or do different companies and different sectors think about this differently? Um, that's a little bit different, uh, because uh, there's some in industries are uh, uh, they were victims of their very bad attacks, high profile attacks, and uh, they are really aware of the cybersecurity issues. Uh, some industries, they, well, they know about that, but they were not victims. And it's like a, uh, there was a, they know there was a disaster, but it was in a different city. So there's a little bit uh, different level of awareness. Uh, for example, the gas and oil industry, they are really aware because there are two attacks of the, well, the, um, which could be called, called uh, the cyber sabotage or cyber terrorism. Um, attack on the uh, Iran oil companies, uh, which we don't have uh, all the details, we don't have samples, uh, but we have more information about the attack on Saudi Arabia uh, Aramco oil company, and that was a big disaster there. So the gas and oil, they are really aware of the security issues, and they are really scared by, poss um, by the possible scenarios. Uh, other industries which were not not yet victims of such attacks. They know, they understand the risks, but not so, not so much. Which are the industries that you would say are less concerned? Um, for example, transportation, because they were they were uh, they were victims of the very serious attacks uh, eight, nine years ago. If you remember such uh, attacks, uh, the network worms uh, like uh, Slammer, Blaster. Uh, other the worms, internet worms of uh, the beginning of that century, and uh, there were very big damage on some uh, transportation companies. The airports, the the check-in uh, was simply damaged. It was they were not able to check in passengers. Uh, as far as I remember, the railway in Australia was badly hit, uh, and it even stopped the operations. Uh, but that was eight years ago, so they don't remember. But I'm afraid that every industry. And if they're a victim of um, high profile attack, uh, which can not just uh, damage the reputation of the company, not just to make their financial damage, uh, but also they paralyze uh, their company, the enterprise, or government agency, what else. Unfortunately, last year we had such examples, and uh, the IT security experts, we were talking about uh, these worst case scenarios for quite a very long time. Um, now we have uh, well, the real, real stories, real attacks in our hands. Uh, now it's much easier to talk to uh, governments, uh, enterprises, not only to IT security people, but to the CEOs, presidents, uh, because we have not just scenarios in our hands, but also the real facts, what can happen, what already happened with uh, some companies. What are the industries that are most vulnerable? I got to the endless loop. <laughs> <laughs> all, all, all of them. Well, um, let's think about uh, the most critical industries, which we really depend on. Um, I think that's power. Because if uh, if it's a blackout, nothing works. Um, telecommunications, 
transportation. I think this is, this is the most critical. Ah, military. Could be military victim of such attack. Sure. Yes, of course. Sure. Three options. Uh, so I think that's uh, these are power, transportation, communication, and military. Okay, well, your point is particularly well made here on 16th Street because those of us who live in New York, south of 34th Street, saw what it's like to be without power. And it has an immediate and, and quite chilling impact right away. Um, so, Howard, um, Eugene made a really important point just now that the issues of cybersecurity have moved you know, outside of the very focused community of the security guys, the IT security guys and are now being raised in the C-suite. Is he right? And are all CEOs, their top leadership teams, boards, really attuned to this issue? Yeah, and I, I would never use an absolute like all of them, uh, but I would say there, there is some that now are very much aware of it, as Eugene pointed out. Those that have been a victim, you can guarantee the next board meeting, they were this was an agenda item. Uh, and if they're good, and many of them are, uh, it not only was an agenda item in, in the direct aftermath, but it's also now a regular, every every time they have a board meeting, it'll be on the agenda. I know the, the, some of the boards I sit on, that's the way we have it. But the problem is, that Eugene was absolutely correct. Well, it happened to them. They asked someone, can it happen to us? And there is generally, if they get to talk to the security person personally, there's generally a pretty good understanding of what the risks are. But oftentimes, it's filtered. So by the time it gets to them, it says, oh yeah, it can't happen to us because they do business differently than we do. Or we're our, you know, the one I heard who just blew me away was, well, we use passwords, uh, you know, which is always- A unique practice. Yes, uh, you're, nobody else does that. So, so the bottom line is, I think the biggest thing for us is, that's where we really have to focus on some of the activity. And on Davos, uh, uh, preparation for Davos, some of us had meetings to talk about that piece of it. Uh, just since I retired from the White House uh, last summer, we've had uh, four or five events now where, I mean, meeting with security professionals and, and journalists is great, but you oftentimes, the same people understand the same thing. But having these meetings we've had with top level CEOs, 40 to 100 of them, at a time, major CEOs from a company or from a country sitting down and saying, unvarnished, here's what's going on out there, here's how it affects you, whether it's just theft of intellectual property, whether it's potential reputation issues, whether it's disruption of your activity, uh, you know, that is on the increase, but nowhere near as much as it should be. Uh, two other quick points I made. One of them, in order to make sure at least we get the next generation, uh, we need to make sure that the business schools are teaching us to the future CEOs the risk, not just about the financial risk or the sales risk or the international disruption of rare earth materials and things, but also the cyber risk. The second thing, and just one thing, because just when Gene talked about the transportation, uh, side of it. It's really interesting because a lot of people don't think about our tremendous dependencies on that. So Eugene had talked about uh, uh, the ticketing piece. So if for some reason that just the ticketing system is down, it doesn't have to be malicious, but it's down. You can't check in mobile like most of us do. You can't go to a kiosk at an airport. That means you can't board the airplane. The airplane doesn't get boarded. The airplane doesn't pull away from the gate which means inbound airplanes don't have a gate to pull into, so they start stacking up. Eventually, in not a very long period of time, generally less than an hour, they have, they have to start diverting airplanes to other airports. International aircraft coming in then have to start diverting. Think of the disruption that takes place because of a failure of a reservation system in one airlines. So these are the sort of things that the chief executives and the, uh, the board of directors need to think of beyond just, uh, do we sell enough tickets to fill the seats next door? Okay, you succeeded in making me scared. Um, but you know, one of the things that you pointed to that I thought was really interesting was this experience you had of needing to talk both to the economic guys and the security guys in the White House. And I think something that I hear a lot from CEOs and from people inside companies who aren't actually on the security or the technology security side of the business is all that we get from our security guys is no, you can't do that. 
And we, people in other parts of the business, need to be focused on delighting our customers. We need to be focused on revenue. And just a flat no, frankly, doesn't really help us there. And, and you're absolutely correct. And, it, and it's really interesting. The, the really good CISOs that I know, I know Eddie's here, I bumped into last night. There are a few others that are in the area. Coming from a security background, it's it's about, you know, in the old days, it's about keeping everything closed in. You can't run a business that way. So the ones that have really moved forward, like Eddie and others that I know, have said, no, I'm not going to say no. I'm going to give you the tools to do it the right way and not cost you a fortune, do it quickly, to be able to mitigate the risk as opposed to trying to do anything absolute. And those are the ones that have been successful. That's the message. Now, there still will be technologists, that I, and one of them, my, myself, that will still say, we can't do that. Uh, but that's a business decision, not a technology decision. And so you have to say, here's the alternatives, here's the way we mitigate that risk. That's the most vitally important thing that we have in that interaction between the business people and the security people. So, so that's a very good point. There are two, two scenarios which can paralyze any business. First of all, it's a malicious attack, and second, too much security. Yeah. Okay, how can, what, yeah. am, I, am I imagining things? Is it possible to have too much security? Well, I think that's, uh, it's possible to have too much security, but it will, again, it will kill, kill any, any business, any, any activity. And the state-sponsored attack and terrorists. And I think that's the end of the story. So we've gotten now to, we've, we've, to the we've seen the worst. Yeah. And I don't even remember what it was now, but so I translated that as there, there's some basic tenets. You would never you want to use fire in a battle if the wind's blowing in your face. Okay? That just makes sense. The second thing you want to do, if indeed you want to use fire and the wind's blowing in your face, you better hope you have nothing that will catch is if you have something to catch fire, it better not be important to you. And I think those are some pretty good principles. When we look at the pieces of malware that are out there, they're being pushed around. Well, a government may say, this is a very, very well-crafted, very specific piece of malware designed to do something very specific. To believe that's going to stay there and never, ever be discovered, never to be reverse engineered and changed, modified, that's just foolhardy. So what happens? You're playing with fire. You have the same vulnerabilities, which means you have an awful lot that's going to burn, burn as well. Thirdly, the things that burn are critical. So the bottom line is, why would you just sort of throw that out there and hope that it doesn't come back and get you? Those are the things we really, really have to, from a nation state level, start thinking about. Uh, I have an answer for that. Please. Uh, because you are responsible to send the fire, and you are not responsible. A different agency is responsible to stop, stop the fire. Right. So you're just working right. in a different government <laughs> agency. Right. And, and does that apply at the corporate level too? Yes, I think so. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not surprised that if uh, some corporations, they also have their, well, their, their own enterprise intelligence. Well, I'm pretty they sure do, they yeah. do. Yes, yeah. they do. Yeah. They do. Uh, and maybe they use uh, cyber weapons as well? Or cyber espionage attacks? Maybe. Well, uh, well I, I buy this scenario. <laughs> so maybe they do it. Uh, and uh, that's why I think that uh, the role of uh, security experts is uh, to explain uh, that we are playing with fire and the wind blows back to us. I absolutely agree. Now, the fire analogy um, maybe makes me think that this is 100% preventable. You know, don't use fire and it won't come back at you. But I was listening closely to what Howard said, um, and a little bit earlier you talked about the security experts giving advice to the CEO on how to mitigate the threat. How should we be thinking about cyber threats? Is this something that we can 100% guarantee won't hurt our country, our company, ourselves personally as an individual? Or do we need more to think about 
it's going to happen inevitably, how do I deal with that? Uh, well, it's not a question, eh? is it going to be to happen or not. Uh, the question is when and how, how bad. <laughs> and uh, there are some enterprises, uh, they are facing thousands of attacks a day, uh, especially their financial organizations. For them, it's definitely not a question, uh, will they, are they going to be hacked or not? Well, sooner or later it will happen. So I'm afraid the same is about their any other industry and uh, it's the same for the critical infrastructure. It's not a question, are we going to face uh, the cyber sabotage attacks or not? I'm afraid we will be. So we have to think about that as a reality and uh, we all we need to understand that we live in a very dangerous world. The IT systems, the computer systems, the networks, uh, mobile systems, they were introduced within a very short period of time. And we did have time to adapt ourselves and uh, uh, our mindset, the security uh, to handle these uh, issues. Uh, it's like the uh, IT is a great innovation. It's, I, I'd like to put it into the list of such innovation as uh, uh, electricity, uh, transportation, uh, nuclear. So first of all, we enjoy, uh, first of all, the innovation. Yeah, oh, electricity, oh, that's cool. Then we enjoy this innovation. Oh, there, there's an electric light. And then we face serious problems. And then we introduce security, government regulation, uh, the companies responsible for security, uh, the universities, they teach uh, students how to manage the power grid and uh, power plants, etc., etc. So first of all, innovation, uh, benefits, problems, and then knowledge and expertise. And you and, think and we're that, now in these and security takes, stage? Yes, I'm sorry, and that takes decades. In case of IT, it's like, like that. We have no time for that. So that's why we're on the stage that uh, the genie came from a bottle, but we don't know what to do with that. We still don't have questions to ask. <laughs> I, I like very much, Yevgeny, uh, your parallel with, say, electricity or the combustion engine or maybe the discovery of fiber if we want to go back into the yes, history. Perfect. But here's the catch. Electricity was discovered and used, and that's been kind of it. We don't have constant innovation in the use in the electrical field. Whereas with technology, it's constantly evolving. There are constantly new uses, new applications. We're moving now to people talking maybe about this, you know, Google is very exciting now with a self-driving car. I mean, how is it even possible for security thinking to keep up with the constant innovation we're seeing in the technology world? Uh, yesterday I sent an email to one of my experts uh, they here. I'm talking about the security issues. And I said, uh, come to expect the perfect world after one century of innovations. So I believe one century. maybe maybe one century of innovations, non-stop innovations in IT. Uh, but well, to be honest, I'm sure that the uh, humans, human brain has some limits, and uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that maybe in some years, maybe one century, uh, that will be the end of uh, well important IT innovations, like uh, like it happened with electricity, with the transportation, and well other technologies. Okay, when is that? Just for the journalists in the room, this will make a good headline for someone. When is going to be the end of technology innovation, according to Evgeny Kaspersky? Uh, well, uh, I hope I hope uh, I will die before the end of innovation. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's a, that's a positive message. <laughs> I, I, I agree because we were sitting there and, and just when you think something new can't be done, it gets done. Uh, and that's the beauty of, of innovation and technology. Uh, I remember back in the, I was telling someone uh, on, on Monday, I remember when I had my first uh, Z80 processor, uh, one of the early computers, uh, and it had a 16K RAM pack that I plugged up in the back, a Mylar keyboard, and I said, it could never, ever get better than this. <laughs> and then they came out with uh, the Commodore 64 with an 8-inch flop, and I said, it could never get better than this. Uh, and of course, many of us learned it constantly gets better. So I agree with your team. I don't want to be here if it stops. Uh, I, I can add uh, that uh, 
uh, you were just recently talking about uh, crime, cybercrime, and you said traditional cybercrime. I just remind that 10 years ago we were talking about traditional crime and cybercrime. Now we're talking about traditional cybercrime right. <laughs> and the rest of threats. Okay, that is a very good transition, Eugene, to my final sort of blitz question. Our time sadly is coming to an end. And so in conclusion, I want to ask, oh, they tell me we have 10 minutes left because we started late. So I'm not going to quite get to my conclusion. I'm going to ask you one more um, big issue I'd like to touch on. We've been talking about the technology revolution, how it's transforming our world. One of the big transformations, Howard, is consumerization. And we see technology moving from being something in, handled at a corporate level, handled at the C-suite, handled by the CTO, and sort of flowing down to the people working in a company, to something that as individual consumers and as individual workers, we are choosing for ourselves. People are bringing their iPhones into work and insisting that they can use them for work they're bringing their air books into work, insisting they can use them for work, often to the rage and frustration of IT, corporate IT security. How much of a factor is this, and what will the impact be? It's tremendous impact, and I think it flips the whole paradigm upside down. I remember there was a, there was a movie a number of years ago with John Travolta and Christian Slater. They were pilots, and they had these two nuclear weapons uh, on the airplane, and, and uh, through all the wind broke and they crashed and they were going to steal the airplanes. And one of the guys at the Pentagon was saying, we have a broken arrow. And the person sitting next to him says, what's that? He says, when someone steals a nuclear weapon. And he says, I don't know what bothers me worse than the fact that somebody stole one or it happens so often we have a code word for it. <laughs> and that's the, the, the same thing here. When you look at, you know, where are we at? BYOD is a word now. It's, it's something that we com have come used to because basically so many of us are bringing our own devices into work. It's no longer saying, here's the technology that you have, here's how you get to use it. You use it in your office and then you don't get to take it home with you anymore. Uh, I remember the days of the old, we used to call MIS departments uh, that used to set, that was your technology. And one of the most, you know, and, and over my career, I've been in some interesting positions where we've created conflict but it's the one where you're sitting there saying, no, the technology you're giving me is not working, it's old, but this is what you get. So what had happened? I went out and bought it my own motive and I would dial up outside, which a lot of people would wind up doing. So it's and I'm sure that was great for security. Well, at the time, it was security by obscurity. Nobody else knew what was going on. But, but the, the, the point being is now it's flipped around. People walk in and say, we need this technology. And it's not only the, the, the general workforce that's doing it, you have executives walking in uh, that says, oh, by the way, I've got this new thing, make it work in our network. Uh, and that's, that's sort of the way it works. The way you deal with that is you're on the front end of that thing. You're not, you don't have yourself buried where tech, uh, advancements in technology is sort of a bad thing. You embrace it. You anticipate, how can I make this work better? How can we make the business work better? How can I give that person the ability to sit there on the beach in Maui with their uh, mobile device and answer a question or do a PowerPoint, and then they go back 20 minutes later and do their thing? Those are the sort of things that have to be thought through the corporations, not, once again, stop, you can't use these things on our network. OK, that sounds like a beautiful scenario. Is it actually happening yes, in most companies? Yes, it is. It is, and, and that's the piece about it. When you start looking at, there's there is another business reason for this. Instead of you going out and spending, you know, a thousand dollars U.S. to buy somebody a device to do their job, they bring their own in. You give them a few applications. You give them some way to strong authentication. Use some encryption technology to keep to protect your corporate data. That's a win-win all the way. I love the business rationale. Force workers to buy their own working tools. <laughs> It does not, it, it, that's the piece. If you had to force them, they wouldn't do it. You gave, what do you think about this consumerization and the impact that has on the security issues? Uh, well, um, I think that we are, we are a happy generation because we were born before the IT revolution. And we still wonder, uh, watching these new technologies, new services, uh, well, well, IT security experts, of course, they wonder watching new threats uh, in cyber warfare. Uh, and I think it will be 
changed with a new generation because uh, the kids, our kids, they were, they used to see all these innovations. They used to live in a world of innovations. So a big surprise for them will be the day when innovations just start stop. They will be a big surprise for our kids when there are no more innovations, when the IT, uh, well, sooner or later, but maybe they'll come to the, to the plateau. Uh, so for us, I think that we are, we can't talk about consumerization because we, we still remember the world with before technology, with all these technologies. For, I think that we are somewhere, we are a generation in between pre-computer era and computer era. So we are in between, uh, so I don't accept the term consumerization because I still wonder. This is, this is using Rupert Murdoch's idea of the digital natives versus the digital yeah, yeah, yeah. immigrants. Yeah, digital immigrants, digital natives. That, that's, that's correct, we are immigrants. And, and, and what about at Howard's term of BYOD? Is, is that something, bring your own device, is that something people are talking about? Is that something you see your clients starting to grapple with? What, 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 what are you talking about? The digital is everywhere. All these screens, uh, this photo camera, uh, the guys who are managing our panel from out there. It, it, it's everywhere. So I don't like this term, bring your own device. Because here, the, we are devices if we believe in matrix. <laughs> uh, I, I like that idea, that we are devices. But they are now having conferences, seminars on BYO, BYOD. I mean, it, it becomes like cloud computing. We've been doing cloud computing for a long time. Uh, one of the first instances was when Hotmail was out there and then Microsoft was part. So we, but now we have a word called cloud computing. Same thing with these things. We've been looking for mobile devices since the early days of the Palm Pilot. Uh, and maybe before that, what was the, somebody remember the first uh, Apple, uh, Newton, the Apple Newton. So we've been looking for that, but now there's a term associated with it. And that was my point, that we wind up now, these things are so normal, there's just attach a name to it and move on to the next yeah. thing. And, and I don't like the term cloud, because well, when you're connected to the cloud, technically the server could be somewhere in the basement. That's correct. Okay, our time is running out, so I'm now going to do my last blitz question. One of the things I've really enjoyed about this conversation is your openness to the new, new thing and, and sort of the baseline in the thinking of both of you has been there's something new coming around the corner. So what I would like to hear from you in conclusion, starting with Howard, then you gave me what is the new, new thing? What, what's the new thing that you're thinking about that maybe might be a surprise to some of us here? You mean from a threat perspective, security perspective, Whatever innovation perspective? Whatever you want. Dazzle us with the new, new thing that's yeah. on your mind. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think that the thing is on my mind is how are we going to take all these things that we have tremendous capabilities with and actually use them? Uh, you know, and, and I sit there and I've got probably five, six hundred apps on here that I don't use, so a whole lot of this is wasted. So what can I find that's really gonna make a difference in the way I run my life, I run my business, the way I communicate, have it all consolidated into something that's reliable, uh, that, that I can get the benefit from, and not be drawn into all these distractions. I mean, that's where I wind up wasting time, is looking for other things. Simplification is your new new thing. The new new thing? Simplification. Yeah, that's it, right. Uh, the new for me is, uh, that uh, during uh, 25 years, I'm in the IT security for 25 years, so that's, I will celebrate uh, uh, the first virus which infected my computer somewhere in October uh, this year, 25 years, it was in uh, 1988. Uh, Soviet Union still existed. Yes, it was wow. Soviet Union. Yeah, there was no internet. Fidonet, if you remember, Arpanet version. I did have access to Arpanet, of course, from Soviet Union. <laughs> so, uh, the news is uh, that all the time I was thinking about future scenarios of cyber threats. I was thinking about future cyber threats, about the worst case scenarios. Uh, what it will look like, what <coughs> technologies we need to develop to protect. And the news is that maybe we came to the worst case scenarios. From uh, little hackers, uh, kids, we came to the cyber crime, then organized cyber crime and hacktivists. Now maybe the state-sponsored attack and terrorists. 
And I think that's the end of the story. So we've gotten now to, we've to, to the we've top. seen the worst. Yeah, in the real attacks. So the next, I think, will be the attacks which follow these scenarios. And that will be the worst case. That will be the, the worst we can enjoy in a cyberspace. So I'm optimistic. Yes, no, I find that an optimistic the, 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 scenario. The, the cyber terrorism in a global catastrophe or a regional catastrophe in a critical industrial environment, that will be the worst we will see in the cyberspace. Uh, so uh, it's the worst, so that's time to think about the uh, perfect world, so the uh, secure, uh, and safe uh, cyberspace uh, in, uh, in for individuals, for enterprises, for governments, and for whole the whole the whole the world. Okay, I'm going to summarize in one sentence. Your point, Evgeny, is there are no more unknown unknowns. To use that great yes. Donald Rumsfeld phrase, and I, I do find that very reassuring. Yes, I think that we explored the universe of cyber threats, and we can we have a. Knowledge. We have a map, we have, we have enough. and Howard's is we're going to enter a peer, an era of simplification. Right. And I want to thank you both for helping to map this terrain for us and making it simpler to understand. Please yes, go ahead and thank you. I have, I have, I have, make a picture of you. Just <laughs> <in the room. laughs> Turn the house lights up. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs>